good economics my students so this is my first video for you and I would like to just explain chapter 3 and 4 so um, I think it's good to show this in the video because what you can do with this video is you can go and rewatch it as many times as you like you can go and see uh, stuff that you struggle with or can't really struggle with and you can go and rewatch this as many times as you like okay so Let's start with chapter 3 and chapter 4. Now chapter 3 and chapter 4 should never be studied as separate chapters. Always the same. Why? Because it's just a big section or a big story to tell. Okay. Now chapter 3 and 4, demand and supply and elasticity is always related. So let's start with demand and supply and move to elasticity. Now like I said in the revision class, I'm going to go to um, the total revenue test and the consumer surplus. But before I get to that, I just want to quickly show you something very important. Now you all know the, the law of demand. The law of demand states that if the price increases, the quantity demand decreases. Okay, And you all know the determinants of demand. But it's very important that you actually understand uh, this law of demand. Because some students struggled with this following concept. And let me explain this scenario to you. So you have your demand curve. Okay. Okay, so here's your demand curve. Now, every point on the demand curve, and the reason why it's negatively sloped, is the law of demand, which states that as the price increases, your quantity demand decreases. But now, as you extend your studies and you go on with chapter 3, you get to a case where you say, okay, well, I'm going to increase my demand, but what's going to happen to my price? Now, let's take a case like that, where I say, let's increase your demand. Now, remember the word, not quantity demand, but demand. There's a difference between quantity demanded and your demand curve. So if we increase our demand curve, okay, if we increase our demand, then what happens to prices? You should see if we increase our demand, prices will also increase. Okay, and that is where some students get tricky, uh, get it gets complicated for some students because they study that the law of demand states that as prices increase, quantity decreases. But now all of a sudden, because demand increases, price also increases. And the reason for that being is that the demand line is the law of demand. But shifting to another demand curve is actually an entire different thing. Okay, so you can always think of, think of it like this. If the price changes first, then your demand will decrease. Law of demand holds. But if your demand changes first, it will increase your price. So if demand increases, price will increase, and that will not really be a law of demand. Okay. So the law of demand has to do with the quantity and the price, where the demand curve or the line is a shift in the line which increases your prices. Okay. And which is fairly simple in terms of your own understanding, hopefully, because if you demand more of a product, then that price of that product should increase. And if the price increases of a product, you demand less. So again, here is the natural forces of demand and supply already explaining itself here, where you increase your demand, so prices increase, but as the prices increase, you demand again less later on. So that's the law of supply. And that's also why in the classes I said to you, you've been dealing with supply and demand your entire lives. Okay, so you've been dealing with this your entire life now for 19 years. Yeah, when you were little, five or six years old, you went to the shop with your mom or dad and you said you wanted to buy some sweets. What did you have then? Demand for sweets. Okay? Someone supplied the sweets, some sweet manufacturer actually supplied the sweets, so that's a supply side. Okay. So everything you see, everything physical, is related to demand and supply. And demand and supply is actually the invisible hand in the economy, the driving force behind people demanding more and being supplied with the products. Okay, so that's the basis. But let me not go into too much detail. Like I said, I want to explain two different difficult concepts to you, the total revenue test and the consumer and producer surplus. Okay, that's the more difficult work, I think, in chapter three and four. So chapter three, just to conclude, now your shifts in chapter three. So when I say demand increases and supply increases, or one increases, one decreases, what effect will that have on quantity? So you have that table in your textbook and you also have the different graphs. Maybe know them because that's very important for you to understand 
that if the price increase or if the supply increases and demand decreases, what will happen to quantity and what will happen to price? Okay. Or if just supply increases, what happens to price? Or if just demand increases? But just the, the beginning of the video, please note that the law of demand and the demand curve shifting is two different things. Okay. So let's go on to the total revenue test and then the consumer producer surplus. So total revenue test, I told you in my classes that when you think about demand, you think about yourself as a consumer. When you think about supply, you think of yourself as a producer, as a firm, a business owner. Okay? Why? Because everything else falls just into place when you think of yourself as a producer, as a firm. So. So let's go to the third revenue test. Now, if you're a firm and you own a small firm, you're either being involved, you have two options. You're either involved in a product that is elastic or inelastic. Elastic or inelastic, okay? And for you as a firm to get more revenue or to earn revenue, you need to know what type of product you're dealing with. Are you selling bread or are you selling laptops? Okay. Laptops is a more elastic product because as the price of laptops increase, we demand a lot, a lot less. Bread, which is something that's a necessity, even if the price increases, we demand still a fair amount of bread. So that product is inelastic, insensitive, irresponsive to price changes. Where the other product, elastic, is sensitive to price changes. Now, if you understand that as a firm, so Total revenue test is not really important. Elasticity is not really important for any consumer. They don't care about it. It's just important for a firm. Because if you are a firm and you know this, then you can determine what drives your total revenue. Let's take that one case where you're dealing with an elastic product like the laptop or the cell phones. So let's say you have the cell phone and you sell the cell phones, but now your product is elastic. How do you get more revenue? Now you know that if you increase your prices, less people are going to buy it and you're going to decrease your revenue. But you know also that if you decrease your prices, more people are going to buy it and it will increase your revenue. Because when your product is elastic, your total revenue is driven by quantity. So the more you sell, the more revenue you get. That's why when a product is elastic, its total revenue is driven by or the firm selling that product, total revenue, is driven by quantity. So they want to sell it at the lowest possible price and sell the most of it so they can get more revenue. That's why we say, in an example, if the price increases or decreases and your product is elastic, then your total revenue should go up because your quantity goes up. And so the total revenue follows the quantity. Total quantity is a stronger is the driving force behind your total revenue. Okay, that's for that section. The other section we talk about, or the other option, is when your product is inelastic, insensitive to price changes. Let's take the example of bread. So, for a bread maker or a bread seller, they know that they can increase the prices and people won't decrease their quantity by as much. So, what do they do? They increase the prices higher and higher and get more revenue. So, the revenue is driven by price. Or total revenue is driven by price, or total revenue follows price. Okay. So if ever the price increases, that increases your total revenue when you're dealing with an inelastic product. Okay. So that's the two different cases. Firstly, you have the elastic product, then you have the inelastic product. The inelastic one is driven by prices, the elastic product is driven by revenue in terms of their or sorry, in terms of quantity. But the inelastic product is driven by prices and the elastic product is driven by quantity so think of yourself as a firm and how that relates to to that okay so that's very important to you understand that so if the price let's say increase and the product is inelastic then what do we do we say if the pro if the price increases and the product is inelastic it means that the total revenue will also increase why because for an inelastic product total revenue follows prices. For an elastic product, total revenue follows quantity. So, 
And that's very important for you to understand. And maybe if you don't take economics further, and this is the last time you hear from me, then you can take this, is that in your life you might be dealing with a business or your friend might have a business, you might uh, own a business one day, a small owned business, and your success can be determined on do you know your market, do you know your product, do you know whether your product is elastic or inelastic. If you ask around the people and ask them um, where do, can they buy other products, how uh, substitutability of your product, can they be replaced by other products, and you find this information, then you can determine, listen, I can increase my price by 10 Rand and still have a lot of quantity being sold and that will increase your revenue. Where if you know this and now I'm in a very competitive market, I should keep my prices as low as possible because my quantity is driving my total revenue, then you need to do just that. So understand whether your product is elastic or inelastic and then you can earn more profit and total revenue. And you be even be an advisor to someone one day in terms of their small business they have. Okay. So I hope you take that maybe from this video and this section and that's also why I try to teach chapter 3 and chapter 4 is because I believe you can go uh, above and beyond economics, you can use it for other practical reasons and other courses and other interests. Okay, so then we move on to the last section. Okay, now I'm not, I know I'm talking fast but again you can re-watch the video as many times as you want so that's why I'm not holding back anything. So. Consumer surplus produces surplus. How does that work? Uh, what you do? So let me take an, you through an example. Of consumer produces surplus. Consumer surplus. You go to the shop and you want to buy a Kit Kat. Your favorite chocolate is a Kit Kat. You have a hundred rand with you. You are willing to spend hundred rand on the Kit Kat. You walk into the shop and the Kit Kat is only worth ten rand or being sold for ten rand. What do you get? You get a consumer surplus of ninety. Why? Because you were willing to pay 100 Rand and now it's only being sold for 10 Rand. So your surplus you're getting out of this deal is 90 Rand. So consumer surplus is a difference between what you're willing to pay for the product but what you're act and the difference between what you're willing to pay and actually paying for the product. That's consumer surplus. Producer surplus, let's take the producer now. He was willing to sell the Kit Kat for 2 Rand but now he's selling it for eight, 10 Rand. So what is his producer surplus, his producer surplus is 8 Rand because he was willing to sell it for 2 Rand but now he's only sell or, or he's selling it for a higher price than 10 Rand so it's a difference between what he was willing to sell it for and what he's actually selling it for. That's producer surplus. You can even use it on a graph if you want to. Okay, You have your demand curve, you have your supply curve, supply, demand. This is the 100 Rand you pay for the Kit Kat or you have for the Kit Kat, then you pay 10 Rand, and this is the 2 Rand the owner was willing to sell it for. Now the market forces come in, they settle at the price, 10 Rand, so the market settles at 10 Rand. So this entire section is your consumer surplus, and this entire section is your producer surplus. Okay, so on a graph you can see that from the Kit Kat, and then they sell a quantity of Q1. Okay, so this is consumer producer surplus. Efficiency losses, very easy, is it just states that this is the most optimal price and optimal quantity being sold and bought. So if you choose any point below this Q1, let's say Q2, okay, then you actually forfeit this area. And you don't get that surplus and we call it dead weight loss. Because like I said in the example, let's say you go in with 100 rand. You buy it for 10 Rand, but then you say no to the owner, the shop owner, listen, I want to pay 100 Rand for this chocolate, I want to pay 100 Rand. It's impractical, it's dead weight loss. Okay, Because the best place for the economy to be is at 10 Rand and selling at Q1. But if, you, if you have a Q2, then you're actually selling it or you're paying more than your equilibrium price and the owner is selling it for less than what he can actually sell it for. Okay, So that's the um, the point of efficiency losses and dead weight losses, it's losses to society that happens when you're not at your optimal point. And remember, your optimal point is always where your demand and supply meet. Like I said in the previous classes, that's the market forces, the invisible hand driving the economy. Okay, Everything we see, every product we deal with has a demand and supply. Um, people demanded a faster way to get from point A to point B. Cars were invented, so supplied 
people demanded it and the price settled at where the demand and supply met. Okay. And that is the most efficient price. So that's the basic concepts or the more difficult concepts in chapter 3 and 4. Um, but please see chapter 3 and 4 as an integrated chapter um, in terms of the calculations and so on. Um, go through them. No price at this You know the midpoint formula we only use when we specify you to use it. But like I said, this is not the only things that are important for your exam, but it's just difficult concepts that I want to explain to you so you feel better about them. It's been enjoyable lecturing you this year. I've been lecturing second, third, and honors levels, and it's been my first first year class, so I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. I like learning for all, um, lecturing for examples because that's the best way to learn. Like I said to my other classes, um, if you take your own personal experience in life, your personality, how you study, how you've experienced life, you can just add economics to it. Don't make economics your foundation. Don't make economics the foundation you base everything on. Make your own life the foundation and then make examples out of your own life to study economics. That's how you study and remember things. Why? Because you're an expert in your own life. You've been living it now for 20 years. So you're probably 20 years of experience is worth more than six or uh, three months in economics. So use your own life as a foundation. Make examples from your own life to, uh, to understand and remember economics. And then economics will just be another subsection within your life that's very easy to understand. Do this for other courses also. Use your own personality. That's why I believe the best way to study is via examples that you can understand and relate to. Because as soon as you relate to something, you understand it and remember it 10 times more than a theory or a definition or a textbook or anything else. Okay. Thank you very much. Enjoy the, the study. Um, good luck with the test. Relax. Go and enjoy the test. Write slowly. Make sure you know everything. Um, you have the weekend still to study, so go and study hard. Um, and I hope, hope you learned something from our side. I hope I taught you something at least that you can take forward, even if you're not doing economics, to maybe take it forward in other subjects and use it in a practical way. And always remember that a human being can never be defined by a piece of paper. While that piece of paper is valuable, it's still not uh, definable to a human being, okay? Or still not as worth as a human being. So always know that you are 10 times more worth than the paper you're writing on, okay? Thank you very much.